Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 306, Rhetoric of Pop Culture, with me, Dr. Matt Barton. And uh, this is a lecture covering, very briefly, McLeod Chapter 3, Blood in the Gutter. <laughs> it's a great title. I like a, you know the idea of a lecture called Blood in the Gutter. I mean, how can you not get excited about that? Uh, it's a pretty short chapter, so again, we're not going to go on for hours here, but uh, there's a couple of points, and there's... Um, a little bit of terminology and a fun uh, little activity will do uh, with some of what McLeod gets up to in this chapter, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, but here's an overview of what we'll be talking about today. We'll get into uh, this concept of closure. Uh, that's a really key concept, not just for comics, uh, but we'll see something similar in the uh, television shows as well, the, uh, the medium of television, and really uh, just about any form of fiction, if not just forms of uh, communication in general. Uh, employ some form of closure. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, now, but again, we'll pick it up later on. Uh, then this uh, idea of the gutter in comics, which is, of course, related to closure, the, you know, spaces in between comics from panel to panel. Uh, and then we'll get into these various types of transitions in comics, and that's what the activity will pertain to. And then finally, how those uh, ratios of transition types can affect and shape a, a narrative, uh, at least one in comic format. Alright, so to get us started here, uh, I wanted us to think about this little cartoon here at the beginning of the uh, of the comic. Let me pull it up here. Uh, so he's got a uh, himself as a kid sort of walking down the sidewalk and this idea that you only know really what you can see with your own eyes or really even what's inside your own head. I mean, for all you know, the world goes away as soon as you turn around. Uh, there's a movie that all, this reminds me of called, uh, it's, it's got Jim Carrey in it. Oh, God, what's the name of that Jim Carrey movie? <laughs> uh, I'm sure it'll come to me in a second. Uh, but basically the whole, I don't want to spoil it for you, but uh, uh, the idea there is that what he thinks is reality uh, is not. Uh, he's been been fooled some way. I'll leave it to you to watch the movie. <laughs> I can't even think of the name of it, so I don't know how, how I could spoil it. But, but anyway, that's the idea. Um, and the philosophical... Ph philosophical? Yeah, philosophical school uh, that this relates to, or this, this comes from, I guess, is called solipsism. And I always thought, kind of like McClown, this is one of the coolest philosophical ideas out there. Now, it's kind of the bane of uh, philosophy professors because, <laughs> you know, every student, I guess, every freshman philosopher comes in thinking that they've, they're have they the only people that have ever come up with this idea. Uh, they probably haven't heard the word solipsism, but they think that they have, uh, you know, created this idea on their own, not realizing it's actually fairly well established, if somewhat irritating to professors' <laughs> philosophical uh, principle. Uh, but anyway, this is from Wikipedia. They, they explain it pretty well, as usual. Uh, they say it's the philosophical idea that only one's mind sure, is sure to exist, right? They can go back to Descartes for something similar. You know, I think, therefore I am. That's the only thing you can know is that you're, you're a thinking being. Uh, but for all you know, the senses are fooling you. You know, you could be in the Matrix. This could be a artificial reality. You could be dreaming, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the only thing or anything outside of your own mind is uncertain. It could be fake. Uh, the external world and other minds cannot be known and might not exist outside of your own mind. Uh, there's a th similar school called, a, or similar philosophy named, I think it's Bishop Barclay, I'm wanting to say something like that. Just kind of rem <laughs> kind of uh, remembering back to my, my own uh, philosophical uh, courses. But that one was uh, a little bit weirder in that it wasn't just that everything outside of your own mind was, was an illusion, but specifically it was an illusion put there by the devil <laughs> to try to fool you into sin and temptation into thinking there's no God so that you would, you know, burn into hell, basically. So it was sort of an evil uh, illusion. But uh, anyway, just I want you to think about this concept specifically. You know, first I'm curious if you ever thought about this yourself or talked about it with your friends, but uh, what does it have to do with comics? You know, that's the link I want you to draw. McLeod sort of hints at it, but I want you to see if you can flesh it out a little bit more, what this concept of solipsism has to do with comic books. 
Okay, let's flip over to the comic then. And I wanted to hit a few points from it. Again, just very briefly, you can, <laughs> it's not that hard to follow. You know, even a uh, great thing about McLeod is, you know, when you read those philosophical books like the, uh, like Descartes, for example, or especially uh, modern stuff, or even like that Wikipedia definition of the solipsism, it can get kind of dry, tedious, hard to follow, confusing. But when you put it into a comic book form like uh, McLeod does, suddenly it gets really easy to follow, and it's actually, I don't know about you, but pretty profound and, and just enjoyable uh, just to sit back and think about this stuff. It makes you see the world in a different way. It kind of makes you feel almost like you're uh, <laughs> you know, having some kind of psychedelic experience sometimes. Uh, but anyway, this idea of closure... Uh, pertains to how, let's see how he defines this is mentally completing that which is incomplete based on your own past experience. So this picture here of these Pepsi uh, bottles, or I guess you don't really know what, what it is. It doesn't say Pepsi on there anywhere, but just you've seen that logo before and you know what the completed logo looks like. So when you just see part of it, uh, your, your mind just kind of steps in and fills in the, uh, the missing piece. It's called uh, closure. And he goes through several examples of it. He you know, says it's basically uh, we can't see everything, you know, at any one time. You can only see limited slices uh, with your eyes, or I guess you know we could say the same thing for for any senses, right? Uh, so your kind of your mind is always just filling in all of the stuff that you can see, trying to decide what's important, recognizing patterns, uh, basically, and that helps you to uh, figure out what something means. You can see there this various ways of writing closure. You know, again, some of the, uh, if you look at this one here, I don't know if you could see my mouse, but uh, this closure written in several different ways, and one of them doesn't even have some of the letters. So your mind just kind of fills in that uh, gap there. And then he talks about how newspaper print, if you ever take a magnifying glass and hold it up to a newspaper, uh, a photo in a newspaper, uh, it's actually little dots. It's actually pretty cool to do this. And you can see it just looks like a bunch of dots if you're right up close to it. But then if you step back, you know, again, your mind just kind of fills in those those gaps. And you can see the picture there. Uh, now, let's see what, what, what else is in this chapter here. Oh, the, this is the bit here where the, uh, actually right here. Again, I don't know. I wish I could... I'm relatively sure you can see my cursor. Let me see if I can get a highlighter going here. Here we go. <laughs> okay, so look at that panel in the uh, upper right corner. Because this really explains it pretty well. And so you've got this guy with an axe coming up behind another uh, dude there. The, the dude is running. He's like, no, no. And then you got the guy with the axe coming up behind him. Now you die. Okay. <laughs> and then there's a... a that stops. There's another panel there. And you'd expect this other panel here on the right to kind of be continuing the story, like to show the axe coming down or, or, or him blocking the axe or something to do with that. Uh, but instead, it's just a picture of a, like a city skyline with a moon and it says, yeah, like some kind of scream. Uh, so he says this little gap in between these panels are called the gutter. <clears throat> but what's really interesting is that uh, we don't really, we're never shown, like, what happens there. Uh, it's just we kind of imagine. You know, we get to that E.I., you sort of picture, well, it must have got, he must have gotten chopped. <laughs> uh, there must have been uh, something gruesome that happens in between those, those panels. And, you know, he talks about this in terms of comics, but I'll just tell you right off the bat, um, you see this all the time in television shows. Uh, you know, think about it like a like a sexy scene, but they don't want to show the uh, the sexy scene because of its, you know, maybe it's a family friendly program. <laughs> uh, so what they'll do instead, they'll show like something starting to happen. You know, the the kind of music cues up, but then it'll be like, you know, scene closes, you know, the lights go out, whatever. And then it's like the next morning, you know, and they're up uh, making breakfast or something, and you're just you know, like you kind of <laughs> suspect there must have been something that happened between like going to bed and getting all, like, you know, romantic and then making, the you know, breakfast the next day. There must be something in between those uh, those scenes. But, of course, they're not shown because it's a family-friendly program. But, nevertheless, you're supposed to use your imagination to figure out, oh, I get it. <laughs> I know what happened. Um, and we see the same thing in comics here. 
And you might think, well, that's just, that's just kind of a normal process. But it's actually, when you really think about how this works, <coughs> it's pretty cool. And, you know, a really good uh, artist, comic artist, good writer, good storyteller can use this idea of the gutter and the enclosure uh, and really creative, uh, really just surprising and uh, sometimes freakish ways, really. Uh, but let's take a look here at some of his uh, uh, breakdown here. So what he's trying to do is show you, as a comic artist, some of these different types of uh, transitions between the panels. Uh, so, what, you know, we had the one we were looking at with the guy with the axe and the e ah So that's one type. But he, he, I think he's got maybe <clears throat> six different types. Uh, so let's take a quick look and see if we can... Uh, understand the differences between these. I'll just say up front, you know, I've, I've worked with this book many, many years now, and, you know, sometimes it's really clear, like, what kind of transition it is. It's very uh, obvious, but some of the other one, other times that would be very confusing, and it seems like it could be maybe two different ones. You're not sure which is which it really fits into better. Um, so it's not, you know, necessarily the most what we call mutually exclusive uh, system. But, but that's okay, because I think the important thing is just to sort of grasp the possibilities uh, of the different uh, different ways you might go about transitioning in a, in a comic and how that pertains to the story that you're telling. All right, so let's pick up here where McLeod talks about panel-to-panel -panel transitions. Uh, so what happens here is, as a comic book creator, uh, you, know, you, you, gotta, you can't just put every little moment that happens into a comic. You have to be uh, thinking about closure and where... Uh, what parts are you okay or want the reader to just imagine uh, what happened in between and fill in those gaps mentally uh, versus what you actually want to draw and depict in the comic? And there's different types that McLeod talks about, and they all have a certain purpose in the narrative uh, style. Uh, so the first one is kind of like a, he calls it moment-to-moment -moment transition. And it's really there's not a whole lot of transition that takes place, right? It's a, a very subtle thing, like the, the next moment... You know, if you're watching a, you would never really see this in a TV show, right? Because, I mean, it's just kind of happening all the time. <laughs> uh, if characters are blinking, for example, you don't think, well, there's not a whole lot uh, going on between those those frames. It's like the next second. You know, and it's sort of the same. If you wanted to kind of emulate that in a comic book form, you would use this type of transition. So it's just like the next moment, you know, she's got her eyes open, then they're closed. You know, maybe that was a split second. You're zooming towards this planet. You know, maybe this is like a, you're in some sort of rocket and you're getting a little bit closer and closer to the planet moment to moment, uh, you know, type of deal there. Uh, pretty easy to understand that one. Uh, the next one is the action to action progression. So you're thinking about multiple actions that take place, but it's going to be just the single uh, subject there doing the, the action. And so the baseball player hits the ball, you know, ready to, uh, you know, swings the bat, hits the ball, boom. Pouring a drink, drinking a drink, <laughs> belching, uh, a car, driving a car, running into a tree, right? So you got the same subject in all those cases, but you're moving between different actions. Uh, then we have the subject to subject one, and you notice here we'll be moving to a different subject each time, but we'll be staying within the same scene or the same basic idea. And he says this re does require a little bit more reader involvement. You might have to think a little bit harder about what's actually going on here. And uh, this is, you know, if you think about scenes in TV shows, it might help. Uh, you know, if you think about that, for example, Walking Dead, that opening scene where Rick is wandering around the, the gas station. <coughs> you got a lot of different stuff that happens in that scene, right? Uh, you got the, Rick's not the only character for one thing. You've got the, the little girl in there. So there's, there's a lot of uh, transitions that take place, but it's still kind of, it's all just one scene until it, you know, switches to that different scene with, uh, you know, Rick and uh, Shane in the car. You know, we'll talk about that one in the next transition. But, but, but that's the idea. You're kind of moving around in that scene, uh, looking at different subjects, and uh, but staying within, you know, the, the same scene or idea. Uh, so here we've got uh, the guy with the axe chasing after the <laughs> scary or the scared uh, fellow. Now you die. No, no. And then we've got e ah, you know, written across the uh, uh, the panel there. So you think it's, it's staying uh, within the the same uh, scene of you know, this this murder scene, 
It's not like we leap forward in time significantly. It's a totally different place, a different city or anything like that. Um, but you do kind of have to fill in the gaps a little bit more. There's a lot more left of the imagination that's not just shown to you. Uh, and here's a little bit easier to understand this example, I think. You got these characters talking. You know, this is you see this in all kinds of comics, right? So he says something, uh, and then there's another character that says something else, and then the phone rings. So you got sub all these different subjects, but again, we're all in the same scene, same basic idea. You know, this this would all what happen if you're writing a film script. You know, this would all just be in the same scene. Character says this, other character says that. Phone rings. Now then we go to the scene to scene, and this is, you know, again, to come back to our TV analogy, this would be like when we go from the, you know, Rick wandering around the, the gas station, you know, scenes, they used to do these sort of, you know, funny transitions between the scenes in, in old uh, <laughs> old movies and shows, but, you know, it's like open and close, now we're there with the, uh, Rick and Shane in the car. Uh, so it's a bigger type, type of transition, there's going to be a little bit more time, a little bit more distance maybe in between those uh, different scenes, a little bit more of a break. Uh, a little bit more jarring, I suppose, especially if it's not handled well. Uh, but in comics, it works something like this. So you got the character saying something. He's on the phone saying, you can't outrun us forever. And then there's an, a picture of a house and 10 years later written across the top to give you an idea of, a, you know, a lot of time has passed. Maybe this is the same area, but, you know, it's, you know, clearly we've gone on to a different scene. And here's a different example with the, uh, I guess trying to show you geographical distances. Uh, then we have aspect to aspect, and this is a slightly strange one. And so what he says, uh, this one is kind of, uh, I think the key is time is not passing. So it's almost like the, is this kind of unique to comics, I suppose. And then you're kind of uh, pausing, if you will, and, you know, as if you could pause a TV show and look at, you know, different things within the shot, you know, that you can't really do that in, you know, on TV, but in comics you can. Uh, this can all be the, you know, the exact same moment, but you're just looking at different aspects of the scene or different uh, parts of the room or parts of the, the house. You know, this might be uh, at the window there. We don't really know. Uh, it's just a different aspect. You know, same thing here. So this is a guy looks like he's relaxing in a nice sunny day. Must be nice. And we got some sun, we got him lying down there, we got some birds, and that could all be at the same split second in time. It's almost like a little couple different snapshots all at the same moment, uh, but we're just kind of putting them together to give you a kind of a bigger impression of what this, uh, you know, to set a mood maybe, uh, or to give you a better sense of this place. And then finally, the non sequitur where you've got Panels that don't seem to make any sense at all. There doesn't seem to be any connection between them. It just seems kind of randomly plopped together. Now, you can mentally come up with your own little stories as to how these panels connect to one another, uh, but it's certainly not obvious, and it is very much open to interpretation. Uh, all right, let's uh, move, uh, skip ahead a bit here to the uh, uh, to this. So again, a nice little breakdown of the... Uh, you know, different kinds of uh, transitions he's, he's talking about there. And then he gets into how the typical comic, typical action superhero comic, has a lot of action to actions and then a few subject to subjects, you know, which makes sense. You know, a lot of comics are, you know, punching, kicking. It's a lot of basically one fight scene after another, right? Uh, but there are a few of these subject to subject ones. Again, remember the difference between those. The action to action, wham. <laughs> baseball. Uh, the subject to subject are the ones where it's uh, it stays within the scene or basic idea, uh, but we are uh, moving to a slightly different subject. And since all the remaining transitions are from scene to scene, we have the following breakdown. So he's a uh, he uses his uh, transition types to make a little chart of some of these old Jack Kirby comics. And you can see he's got his bar graph there. Uh, what's interesting is when he gets into the... Uh, yeah, this, this part here, he starts talking about uh, manga. Um, manga, com you know, anime uh, comics, or Japanese comics, Japanese style. And he says that the, 
the transitions are really there's very different ratios like in these uh, you know, subject to subject transitions account for nearly as many as action in this comic here not sure does he see what that is Tezuka Tezuka uh, so this is one way you know if you're somebody like me that likes to read uh, you know if you read manga and uh, Marvel comics or DC comics you, you probably notice this uh, they have a very different feel to them you know there's a lot of differences obviously but uh, you know you might not have thought too much about how the predominance of one transition type between panels over another uh, is, is part of why they feel so different reading them uh, so I think that's pretty cool uh, but what I would like for you to do is go to the uh, Walking Dead comic. Let me bring my question back. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so look at the Walking Dead chapters we've been reading. Uh, you don't have to do the whole book or anything, but just you know, pick a chapter, uh, flip through it, and do a quick. Doesn't have to be super precise, but see if you can just count up um, the different types of panels, panel to panel transitions, like uh, McCloud does here for these other comics. And see if you can figure out which are the top three. So you probably notice at least three. Uh, you might find all six types, probably not. And you'll probably find, uh, you know, a lot of um, two or three of them. Uh, but really, all I want you to do is figure out which types dominate and which types are hardly ever seen. And then think about how the, that ratio affects the experience of reading the comic. Uh, so, for example, if you find that... Um, you know, there's a whole lot of action-to-action, uh, action, maybe, and, and hardly any scene-to-scene. Scene. You know, what would it be like if that was were reversed? You know, how would that affect the, uh, the look and feel uh, or the experience of reading that comic? Now, okay, so I had some fun with that. You know, it's always curious to see what, what people come up with for that. Okay, and I think that... Let's see, well, I'll make sure I didn't skip anything. You know, I think we're, we're good with this chapter then. Whoosh, whoosh. Yeah, I think we've covered all the, the main concepts there. Uh, but as always, you know, take a look through it, and if there was anything that was confusing or you couldn't, uh, or maybe just would like to discuss more, you thought was interesting. I'm certainly happy uh, to talk about those. But I think we'll end it here. And, uh, you know, as always, I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time.